Hey, what's up everybody? It is Kellen here from Start Your Systems again, and welcome to another MXGP3, the official motocross video game career mode gameplay video where I am continuing with the MX2 World Championship today on my trusty KTM 125, going to Talavera in Spain. And uh, again, just like usual, realistic difficulty, or like the most, the highest difficulty with the realistic physics. And um, what else can I tell you about it? Uh, three laps, two races, I usually do two GPs, no qualifying, so I start from the outside every time. And basically just trying to have a good time racing these uh, top tier MX2 guys on a 125 in this game. And so far it's gone fairly well, I've done three races on the 125. And I lost the first one I think, lost the overall, but I've won the, the last two overalls that I did in the last video. So. It's a little bit more of a challenge, obviously, because you're down on horsepower to the 250Fs that you're going up against, but I think it's fun because it's a, it's a challenge. And again, this is another track that I have uh, not played yet, Talavera, and uh, compared to what it looked like in uh, previous versions of the game, this already looks a lot different because it's kind of a darker dirt. I think Talavera in Spain is usually more of like a lighter, kind of a, a hard clay base. Um, most of the tracks that I've seen in Spain usually have like a uh, blue groove quality to them where the track dries out and all that business. But this track can have some pretty good dirt on occasion, but most of the times that I've seen it be raced, it doesn't have the best dirt um, just from what I've seen. So I'm kind of a little bit surprised that they went with this kind of a darker shade of dirt in this version of the game. But that doesn't uh, change a whole lot. Obviously, it's still going to ride pretty similar, and the traction seems to be about the same as some of the other tracks that I've played in this game so far. But this is, all, in my opinion, at least, a pretty cool track. Uh, I like how it incorporates going up and down these hills a lot. And uh, this is probably like the flattest stretch of the track right here, where you come down this back section and there's back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back tabletops. Uh, in, this, in this version of the game, I guess it's doubles, or sort of tabletop doubles. And then it, uh, oops, didn't mean to do that. Comes down into this corner, sharp U-turn, and then back up and down the hills again. That was kind of weird, I got kicked really weird, and there's like three rollers coming into those corners in succession. So not too sure what is the deal with that. But I am buried in the pack and trying to get going forward. Trying to get down to the inside of these guys, making lots of contact, going through the switchbacks here. This jump right here was made famous recently by Valentin Gio um, when he scrubbed the absolute balls off of it a couple years ago, maybe a year ago now actually. I'm trying to think, was it last year or two years ago? But he, there's a fantastic picture of him scrubbing that little single right there. Um, and basically, like, dragging bar off the lip like it was a ridiculous scrub no doubt about it um, so that's pretty much what the most like recent famous thing that's happened at this track would be this is also the place last year I think where uh, Roman Fevra dislocated his shoulder when he crashed in this corner and uh, Cairoli stopped right behind him I think it was during the qualifying race if I remember correctly Cairoli came to a dead stop right behind him trying not to hit him and uh, it was a really kind of a tricky section because of, of the way that the rut led into the corner as an off camber section. And Cairoli was trying to avoid him, so he uh, gunned it up to the left inside of the track. And he did that at the exact same time that Fevre had decided to stick his left arm out to try to like brace himself to get his, his wits about him and plant it again. And uh, Cairoli basically just ran over his arm, and uh, I don't think. Some people were not too thrilled with that move, but I mean it is what it is like Cairoli was just trying to get around him He wasn't trying to hit Fevra and he took a he took a maneuver that really if, if Fevra doesn't move his arm Cairoli doesn't hit him so Cairoli just figured well He's not gonna put his arm there because he hasn't yet I've been sitting here for a couple seconds and he hasn't moved so I might as well try to make this little upwards maneuver around him to, so I can actually get around him and not be stuck here this whole time and it just so happened that Fever does that thing exactly simultaneously. And it, um, like I said, I think it dislocated his shoulder. It definitely made Fever's weekend here really tough. And um, Fever, as the reigning world champion last year, 
uh, was already going through kind of a tough season, and that didn't help uh, one bit. But obviously, neither him nor Cairoli won the world championship last year. That went to Geyser. So in the end, it really didn't like help Cairoli's case to do that. And I'm, like I said, I don't think he was trying to do it on purpose. I think it was just a circumstantial thing. But uh, yeah, that's probably... I'm trying to think of other things that have happened at this track um, of recent memory that I can remember being a big deal. Uh, Jeffrey Hurlings had a big crash at this race three years ago now. Two, two or three years ago, he had a pretty big crash. Um, coming down this section, he got uh, really swapped coming down the left side of this track and then had a really big, almost uh, violently bad endo uh, coming through this back section. And I think he got up and rode away, like not got up right away and rode away, but like was able to get up under his own power and ride off the track. But yeah, it was a, it was a big crash. Like he got kicked bad and tried to get his legs wrapped back around the bike to control it. And it just was too, too little too late. And he just got pitched over the bars hard. Definitely a big crash for sure. And Hurlings, he's, he's kind of, becoming known for having some big crashes man i'll tell you he uh for the big boy that he is and the wild riding style that he has he sometimes has some big time offs and uh that's not the best thing to happen to you especially when hurlings is trying to win the world championship in the mxgp class this year all right eighth and you could tell i was really struggling on that 125 in this race didn't help that i got a terrible start so not helping my case towards the world championship did not gain a single ability this time around almost up into the 60 range with most of my abilities except for rain we haven't had a rain race in this career mode and uh falcon sword may have been the last time we had a rain race and that was three episodes ago so one of these days we're gonna have to have another rain race i think all right let's see if i can get a better start from the outside oh i timed the gate perfectly but I'm still not gonna hit the whole shot because these 250Fs have so much power. That's all right, I'll pass Bogers for the lead into turn number three and go away with the lead. Let's see if I can pull away this time or if these guys really are this fast on this track. So again, as I continue to play this game, I find things that I enjoy and don't enjoy. And um, one of the things that I am enjoying about this game is uh, that it is very easy to just pick up and play and have a good time in like I'm I am pretty well over a week removed from playing this game the last time and picked it up and just started playing it the first time uh, the second I started recording this video in over a week and no problems like I felt comfortable playing it but I just like how there's an actual momentum aspect to this game um, some of the arcadey type motocross games that you play don't have much of a a uh, like y you kind of can just go wide open everywhere and this game you certainly can kind of go wide open everywhere but you do have to you have to break you have to downshift which you see me uh, shifting down shifting up a lot um, you have to plan out where your lines are going to be so you can flow the corners a little bit better um, I feel like there's actual real strategy to carrying momentum in this game and, and I feel like riding a 125 in this game shows that off a lot more too because on a 125 you know you're down on power so the more speed you can carry the better you are and you can kind of see me like arcing out my corners like swinging way wide on the entries and making sure to carry speed instead of just shifting crazily through the gears and hoping that the torque carries me which 250Fs in this game would do for you, but obviously the 125s, um, the two strokes with a power band and all that good business, you really need to focus on not getting too hung up in the corners and come into near dead stops. So I like that aspect of it, that you definitely have to ride both bikes different, like the two strokes and the four strokes are very different with how you ride them in this game, and um, there's ways to make lines work that you wouldn't uh, necessarily think would work and uh, the terrain deformation I think works pretty well as in this game it's probably one of the best terrain uh, terrain deformation aspects that I've seen so that's a cool little tidbit right there I think and yeah, there's just a lot of cool things my uh, headphone batteries are dying I might need to do a headphone battery switch out in between races here just so that I don't completely lose 
all audio sound in this one. But I am on my way to perhaps winning this one. And looking so fresh doing it. I do like this KTM 125. I have now ridden the Yamaha and KTM 125. Obviously the KTM I have ridden more extensively, but I feel like the power is pretty good in it. I've got all the upgrades on the bike now, so um, it feels pretty competitive and fast. Um, it's kind of, I, I wondered, I had wondered when they announced the two strokes if you were gonna be able to pick the KTM 150 to race in this class, which I think technically would be illegal, but I'm not sure of the exact displacement rules. I know that in um, in the AMA series, the AMA Nationals, you cannot race a KTM 150, but uh, I'd wondered if the GPs had some sort of special rule where two-stroke wise you could. Obviously this is a 125 and not a 150, and I cannot select the 150, so I'm assuming that that's probably the case that you cannot race the 150 in the GP series, but I'd wondered if that was going to be a possibility since KTM makes a 125 and a 150 and their 150 is pretty highly touted as a good in-between bike if you're trying to you know if you're switching from a 125 to a 250 a 150 has more power than a 125 obviously but it's still not as abrupt and um not abrupt what's the right word for this it's not as uh harsh like heavy on the gas like when i ride my 250 two-stroke in real life i can tell that it's it's got a lot of power behind it when you get on the throttle like it doesn't mess around so uh, a 150 is like a good go-between because the 125 it yes it has a power band yes it can be kind of poppy but it's not like going to throw you off the back of the bike because it is it, you know for the real sake of it an underpowered bike compared to the 250fs and the 252 strokes and stuff like that so a 150 i think is usually a pretty good go-between bike to to have good amount of power ktm does a pretty good job of handling d different displacements and they've spread that to Husqvarna after they bought bought Husqvarna. Husqvarna spreads it around pretty evenly um, with different displacements and cool things like that. So I won the second moto and ended up second overall, interestingly enough, only behind Paul's Jonas who wins the GP. I am now uh, 43 points ahead of Benoit Patrell in the world championship. And uh, yeah, ability has gone up over 60 now. I'm gonna do a quick headphone change here. Let me see if I can make this happen real quick so I don't lose too much time. Uh, that one is the wrong one. This is just a lot of random noise here. I've got the Siberia Steel Series 840 headset and it has a wireless, it's wireless, so obviously. And uh, it's got a battery in the left headphone, so here goes my headphones going off right now. And this goes in like this. Look at all this random noise in here. Come on, get in there. Why is that not going in? This commercial break is brought to you by Racetech. <laughs> all right, there we go, got that in. Let's get this back on. There it is. And turn the headphones back on so I can hear everything. There we go. Put the extra battery in its charging station, and that has been a momentary battery change. All right, now on to Saint Jean d'Angely in France. I'm excited to try this track on a 125 because there are a lot of hills, and normally this track here is a very slippery surface. So I'm kind of curious to see if that slippery surface affects me at all um, with the traction kind of sliding me around, lighting up the rear tire on the 125. Um, well, maybe it won't because it is clearly a wet track, so rain has come through apparently. Oh, but I'm starting way outside here. Alright, here we go! Way outside, going up against the best 250 riders, MX2 riders, in the World Championship. And, yep, you can feel the bike spinning all the way out of the gate. Although, I got a pretty decent jump for what it's worth. I'm gonna have to weasel my way through here. So you can see we're already going up the first hill, then we're going to come down, then we're going to go up, then we're going to come down, then we're going to go up, then we're going to come down. It's just a very up and down type of track here in St. Jean d'Angely. American fans who don't follow GPs as regularly may remember this track from when Ryan Villapoto, Ryan Dungey, and Blake Baggett won the 2011 Motocross the Nations on this track. Uh, that was the last time the USA won. 
um, famous photos of Ryan Villapoto and Ryan Dungey hugging right after the finish line right there after uh, winning the motocross the nations up to the top of the hill I actually almost pulled that 250F on the left side of me it was either um, Dylan Ferrandis or um, golly what's the other Kawasaki rider from 2016 I'm really bummed that I don't remember this is it Seva Brilyakov? I don't think so I think it might have been someone else either way pulled them up the hill a little bit trying to go after Paul's Jonas this track is very tight and twisty. Oh, don't go off the track. Oh, man. You know, it must have been Dylan Frantis because he's passing me back. Damn, these rollers. Oh. This off camber is gnarly. And it's slippery, too, because it's been raining. All right, now I've got a good run here on Jonas. Let's see if I can swing down the outside, coming down the start straight, and then maybe cut back underneath. Not quite able to get to the inside there. This is fun though. I, I love this challenge of this 125 and how hard it is to um, race these guys that are on 250Fs on realistic difficulty. It probably should be easier. I know there's probably gonna be people, be people out there that say like, oh, this is so easy to win. Like, how are you not winning by a mile? But it really is a challenge. Like you saw, I was right on Jonas there, up and down the hills a few times, and he pulled away. Now Brandis is trying to come get me. Brandis might get me because I just blew that corner. Oh, got to try to power down up the hill. Oh, he really botched the bottom of the hill there. Coming back down the hill. Damn, Ansi flew down the hill right there. And I'm now on Ant Steve for position. Let's see if I can get him. I'm trying to get up onto the podium. I'm gonna try an outside line. He's gonna run me all the way to the edge of the track though, man. Oh, look at that line. Got the power down and everything. Oh, got a great line through there. Trying to double through this section. Almost landed on Jonas, and he's going to run me off the track, too. I pretty much just cut the track right there. Down through the off-camber again. I'm going to tuck to the far inside. Try again on Jonas around the outside down the start straight. And then cut back underneath. Oh, I was trying to get the traction down. Oh, wow, I was able to kind of muscle him out of the way. Alright, so got around Jonas. Now who is leading this thing? Hurling's out the whole shot, but I don't feel like that's Hurling's up there. Maybe it is. I don't know if I'm going to have a chance to get up to him. Are we lapping somebody? It must have just been something I saw randomly out of the corner of my eye. Ah, I overshot this jump again, but worked a little bit better. Oh! All right, got to try to catch Brian Bogers leading this thing, the Dutchman. I love the aesthetics that come with this game too. Obviously, them updating the graphics engine did a lot to that, but the cool things like the um, the things that you don't really think would matter in a video game, but kind of do. Like you have this kind of like foggy haze on the track from the dust being kicked up, which is kind of unrealistic since it's a mud race but you know give them a pass because it's their first year doing it and then you also have these guys on the side of the track which is kind of like europe is famous for doing this i've never seen it happen in the usa but they get these like uh they're like color throwers or something like they put some kind of powder in there and it tosses up a giant cloud of colors and usually if like if it's italian fans they have the green the red and the white for represent the italian flag uh, more specifically, I'm talking about that single right after the finish line that I go over there where they have the uh, red, white, and blue for the French flag because this is a French GP. Like that little aesthetic kind of stuff, like I feel like is really cool and and it, you, you wouldn't think it, it matters, but to me it's kind of like it adds a good effect to the game that um, you don't see in other video games at least. Or you don't see in other racing games like a motocross racing game. But I am not going to get Bogers. He's going to win this thing. 
good on him. He was able to race me down to the line and get me handled right there. But I wasn't too far behind, so at least that's a plus. All right, we're gonna continue on though. Going into Moto2, see if I can't win this second Moto here at Saint Jean d'Angeli. My skills went up again. My rain ability, I think, may have just went up, but I didn't see. It should because the track was wet, but still no, like it's not like a forecasted rain. It's just the wet track thing. Here we go, Moto2. Oh, I'm stuck in neutral. That's gonna be a terrible start. Yep. Well, maybe I can cut down to the inside and maybe pass a few guys. Oh man, they all just swung way wide. I'm trying to carry my momentum. Fifth gear around the outside. Well, that worked out a lot better than I thought it would. Wow, I just made three passes by splitting through the middle of the Red Bull KTM guys and Alexander Tonkov, and I'm already up to third before the end of the first lap. I got Bogers, I got Antsy right in front of me. So two guys I'm kind of fighting for in the, for the overall here. Let's see if I can win the overall at St. Jean d'Angeli. It's a drag race. Bogers already going for the lead on Anstey. I have got to get up there and make some passes happen. Oh. Trying to show them a wheel. There's that uh, little color thing that I was talking about where they have the French colors. Let me try an outside line. Oh, Boger is trying to cut me off and he puts me on the ground. I think I went down myself, but looked like Boger's had kind of just taken the line and put my front wheel down. Now I got to work my way around the Red Bull KTM teammates again. Jonas and Hurlings, and I'm going to screw that up, lose a ton of momentum. Really good in this section right here, trying to get alongside. Got around Hurlings, now trying to get Sewer. Sewer blows the corner, so I got him covered. All right, trying to go after these guys now. Got Tonka battling it out with Bogers for second. Nancy's trying to get away for the lead. I might end up going like 2-2 for the overall at this rate. Oh, terrible drive up the hill. Oh, I can't believe how fun this is. Like, I'm actually having a lot of fun trying to catch these guys right now. Working on shifting through the gears. Making sure not to lose too much momentum. Like, it's it's definitely a real challenge. Alright, got a pretty good drive coming up this hill. I'm already in fifth gear, so I'm gonna get the power to the ground and I'm running up on these guys. This 125 has so much carry up these hills. Oh, it's a four rider battle for the lead. Can you imagine in real life if battles are this close? Like, literally four guys almost on top of each other going for the lead. I just tried to make a line that didn't exist. Trying to get alongside Tonkov, and he's not wanting to give me the room, but I'm going to force him wide. And I got a pretty good drive up the hill, too. Oh, look at Ansi scrubbing it down. He's trying to get after Bogers, who took the lead. Oh, later, Ansi. Oh, around the outside, into the lead. I don't know how long that's going to stick, though, because I ruined the corner and almost looped my Larry coming down the hill. But I am into the lead. So on a muddy track in France, St. John D'Angeli, I'm making this 125 look awful sexy right now. Well, I can't seem to get that first corner complex very good, and here comes Bogers trying to get me back, and I just shifted wrong again. Got to defend my insides here. But that also gives them the freedom to run wide and maybe get a pretty good drive. about I run wide and get a good drive up this hill. I like it. Uh, I'm gonna go a little long though. That's okay, we're gonna make it happen. Coming back down the hill, trying to win the race in St. Jane D'Angeli.
It was a pretty fun track. This might be one of my favorite tracks I've played so far, at least on the wet track setting. Um, it feels like it's pretty challenging, but also really fun. Got like a really good flow to it. Like you can make the lines connect pretty well. I like it. And then I can also almost double into this corner. Nice, nailed it. It almost feels like this game might have a little bit too much traction, to be honest with you. With this track being as wet as it is, you would think it's a little bit harder to just kind of make a rut out of nothing. But I'm kind of just like floating into these ruts and it turns on a dime like no problem. So that's kind of, that's a little crappy that like it's almost too easy to get good traction. But it's not that bad, I guess. But here we go. I'm going to go 2 1 in France. Win another GP on this trusty 125. Two strokes, unite. And I have crashed over the finish line. Look at me go. It's I Believe I Can Fly version 2. <laughs> that was awesome. They just kept getting faster and faster and faster. Oh, man. That's hilarious. All right. Win in the GP in France. Bogers goes 1 2 for the heartbreaking second. But I enjoy winning a GP, of course. Let's see. I'm going to ride this thing through a little bit longer just because I want to see if I get to choose a new sponsor. I do not. Not time for a new sponsor just yet. But, uh, yeah, that's been another episode of MXGP3 Career Mode here on Star Your Systems. If you guys like this video, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Um, and hit us up with anything you want to say. We always try to get back to our loyal viewers with any comments you guys put. Um, but thanks again for watching. Kellen here on Star Your Systems. Hope to see you guys in our next video. Bye-bye.